am so excited about today's episode. Uh, we're, we're going back in time here with a friend of mine who I've, I've had, well, we've been friends for probably a solid maybe 15 years now. Johnny Rabb, amazing drummer. Uh, if you're a drummer, you've, you've definitely heard his name before. Uh, if you are not a drummer, uh, Johnny is the drummer for Collective Soul. But aside from playing in Collective Soul and even prior to playing in Collective Soul, Johnny's had a tremendous career. He's played with artists including Maynard Ferguson, Shadaisy, Tanya Tucker, Mindy McCready, Deanna Carter, and for all you jazz fusion fans, uh, Frank Gambale, uh, who used to play in, in the Trick Korea band. But uh, Johnny uh, is also an educator. He's written multiple books. And in fact, he was even voted uh, the number one best educational author by the Modern Drummer Magazine Reader's Poll. Uh, he's the founder of his own drumstick company called Johnny Rab Drumsticks, which is really was my introduction to, to Johnny back in the day from a bunch of my my drummer friends who all played uh, his drumsticks. And uh, and he also has his own line of cymbals with uh, minor drum cymbals. So thanks for uh, taking the time to okay. talk to us today, Johnny. This is going to be a good time. Michael, absolutely, man. It's great to talk to you, see you. And yeah, man, I'm excited. Good to talk awesome. to you. Well, I would love to just start, you know, I don't really like to have people tell their their story, their history, because, you know, most of the time that's that's so well documented and that just uh, takes up a lot of space. But I would love for you to share uh, the interesting story of how you landed uh, the gig with Collective Soul, because that came out of just kind of a chance meeting at at the NAMM show, correct? That is correct. It's a, it is the word landed is an interesting word. We use that like right in fishing, like landing the big fish. <laughs> and it's, uh, I would say that it is that because to this day, I still get to work with them. We just got done doing some shows two days ago in Toledo. So like, I do feel like I am the drummer of that band. I do feel like part of the family. And the short story was we're at the NAM show. I would think it was because it's January. It was 2012, January, 2012, Anaheim. I was working for Roland still, doing the V-Drum, drum specialist, product specialist, demos, you know, uh, love doing that job, but never did I think, I always told people, that's not the place that you get gigs, it's the place that you go look at gear. For those of you that don't know, NAM is the National Association of Musical Merchants, or Music Merchants, which it is the companies, like you might know, like Ibanez, or whatever string company, or drumhead company, or cymbal company, or recording gear showing the dealers what they can buy. It's they're showing off their new gear, the dealers come to purchase it. A lot of people have made that, I don't want to say it's an error, but you have to admit, Mike, that the the networking has gotten a little silly there. It's like, yeah. put on your best rock outfit and go run the halls of NAM, hoping you can get endorsements or get, and nothing wrong with that. So there's all walks of life there, but it's not where I thought I would meet people from Collective Soul or maybe get a gig. So I'm at NAM. My friend Jen Lowe was a percussionist and singer-songwriter. She had worked with Ed Roland in the past. She'd also worked with Jason Mraz. She's a totally accomplished musician and, and percussionist herself and a good friend of mine. And she goes, hey, I'm having a birthday party at this bar right on that little strip down there by the Anaheim Hilton. Would you come to my birthday party? I'm like, I'd be honored to come to the birthday party. Well. I get there at the party, and, and I'm really tired. This has nothing to do with Jen. But I went, it's Jen's party. I'm going. I got out, up from the nap, get down there, start talking to this dude. And I'm like, not thinking anything. I'm just going, this guy's really cool. And next thing I know, he's like, well, what do you do? And I'm like, oh, I work for Roland doing this and that and the other. I'm a drummer. And he's like, oh, man. And I'm like, and I think I, I, think I thought that he was on a music store or a very cool guy, knew his music. The good thing is, I didn't know it was Will, the bass player from Collective Soul. We were just talking as, as musicians. And, and I'll never forget, the conversation went basically, here's Will. I didn't think anything of it. Again, it's Jen's birthday. Here's Will. And he goes, da da da, we're talking. And, and he goes, what do you do? I said, I do this. And then he said, I'm in Collective Soul. I said, oh, and I didn't freak out. I've always been a fan of that band, even in my Nashville days, right? So I said, uh, oh, man, I know your drummer. Um, Ryan Hoyle, like I, he's like, actually, we're looking for a new drummer um, now. And I go, oh, still didn't think anything of it. Because in my mind, I'm going, nine times out of ten, as we know, somebody in the band already knows someone. It doesn't matter if you get recommended. None of this works, usually, in my opinion. Well, that's where Jen comes in. 
Jen comes over and basically is like, this is your new drummer right here. I promise you, Will, this is your new drummer right here. Now, I'm going to be honest. She, she's heard me say this, but the reality of the situation is Jen's pushing. And I was nervous. I would even tell her this. Too much, too much. Don't. It's too much. Her pushing is what got me in here because she was pushing to Will. She was pushing in a, in a great way, bragging. This is your guy. This is your this is your dude. You don't have to look any further. Like I was like, oh, I'm embarrassed, you know, humbled. And then Fred Crochal was there, their their manager at the time, and he was like, okay, okay, we get it, Jen. And I was embarrassed, and they were like, it's cool. So then the next morning, they say they're going to stop by the Roland booth to watch me do a demo, right? First off was for me to go watch them at the Fender booth play acoustically with Ed in the Sweet Tea Project. And I'm like, man, there's that signature sound of that guy's voice. Whoa, this is, and it was amazing. He killed it. And I'm like, and it's always good when you see somebody live that you've heard only on record, sound killer live. You know right. how that goes. Right. Oh, yeah. And he did. And I was like two feet from him. I'm like, man, there's that voice. Whoa, that, he sounds killer live. Good for him. And good for me because I loved it. That day ended, and Jen the next morning goes, eight in the morning, ring hotel. You need to download a song of theirs and do it in your demo and, and just do something fun with it. I'm like, no, Jen, that is so, so pushy. I'm not assuming. She goes, and I'll never forget, if you've ever trusted me, now's the time to trust me. It won't be stupid. Do it. And I'm like, and I was nervous. I was like, I was really battling her. Long story short, went to NAM with a thumb drive, put it in the back of the Roland TD-25 at the time or something, did my whole demo, my Latin fusion stuff, and then went, oh, and I pretended like I didn't know they were there. And I was like, never did this in other demos, but when I saw they were there, I was like, here comes the time to do a gen sand. And so I put run on, and I said, hey, the, the new TD-25 has a, a feature now where you can do time stretch audio, and I'm going to do a live remix of Collective Souls Run. And so I played the original groove for about a verse into a chorus, and then spun the wheel and did the tempo up to about 130 to a house tempo, switched the drum kit, and then played like a house remix of their thing live, and they were laughing. And so Jen was absolutely correct, and it from there it was, uh, like you said, landed. No joking here, I went fishing with my friend after Nam, and he's like, dude, I think you got it. And I'm like... No, nah, this is not how it works. That's not how it works. I, you know, he's like, dude, this is so cool. You, I think you got it. And he kept saying that. I'm like, no, Matt, that's not how it works. Well, about a week later, Ed called. Hey, Hot Rod. Zed, you want to come jam in Atlanta? I just jam. Sure. And we barely jammed. We played kind of like, you know, no monitors, whatever, in his basement studio. Maybe did Run, World I Know, just like a couple quick verse courses. That was it. And then it was like, I remember calling home to Bridget, my wife, going, I don't know if I got this. Or, you know, this is so, his house is so nice, and he's got an amazing guitar collection. I was really blown away by it. And they're so cool, pe nice people. And um, I'm like, I don't know if they like me or not. It was really that fear. You know, I don't have buddies there yet. They're not my friends yet. And so he's like, yeah, we're going to do this tour, uh, you know, do you want to do it? And I'm like, wow. So kind of the rest is history, but keep in mind, I didn't know that after that tour I was expected to continue. I thought I was just filling in for the tour. Mm -hmm. So the only thing I'm going to add to the story, and it hasn't been told before, is the fact that I knew me and Bridget we were having a, a child on the way, which is Carmen. So eight years ago, Bridget was pregnant. We knew we had a plan C-section that didn't interfere with the tour, but guess what it did interfere with? Other gigs that I didn't know that I was supposed to play. Ah. So, dude, okay. I didn't say anything to management, not because I was being fishy or lying. I didn't know I had the, they wanted me to be the drummer. I thought I was doing the dosage tour, and that's it. Mm -hmm. So it is 12, not 12 years, excuse me, this is the beginning of the 10th year with Collective Soul. They are like family, they're like brothers. We have a blast. It is, I always say this in every kind of like talk, I, I just don't take it for granted. Um, got to do some records with them, a live record I'm proud of, and uh, two or three studio records and more coming out. I mean, it's, uh, it really, really is a kind of a dream come true in the sense of a performance 
gig because I've always loved their music and I've always wanted to play songs. Right. Here's a that wasn't short answer, Mike. My, my no, I, I love it. That that was a great story. You know, I, I saw you on on the Dosage tour uh, here. Here, I just moved back to Nashville and saw you on that on that tour. And Dosage is my favorite Collective Soul record. Yeah, um, and so it was just cool to you know watch you guys play that whole record in its entirety. You know, uh, from start to finish. Um, but you know that also says a lot just about you know putting yourself in the path of opportunity, which yeah. is such a key component to you know having a successful career as a musician or really having a successful career in any you know along any venture that you choose yeah, but yeah. really specifically when it comes to music you know it's, it's a matter of putting yourself in the path of opportunity and in particular like the nam show that's not where you would expect you know uh to have to have an audition right. um but the reality is kind of like what you were saying earlier th- there is there's a lot of uh there's a lot of action that goes on there. There's a lot of networking. There's a lot of meeting. Yeah. So, so just going to the NAM show every year, uh, you know, when you approach it right and you approach it just from the standpoint of, I'm just going to network people. I'm just going to be friends with them. I'm not going to worry so much about what they do. Kind of like your conversation with Will, you know, uh, yeah. you know, it wasn't, who cares that he was the bass player in the band. You didn't even know it when you were talking to him. But then even when you did find out, it didn't turn into this whole, you know, spiel about trying to get the gig. It's just, you know, the music industry is based around just friendships, you know, and recommendations. Yeah. yeah and Will definitely was the one to to kind of, I think, phone Ed and say, hey, I, I found this guy. I think we should try him, try him out type thing. And, you know, you just you reminded me of something that I've not even thought of myself. It takes people like yourself reminding me, is my point, that working with Roland all those years helped me learn the gear, helped me get into electronics, become like a specialist at it. It's like you said, path putting yourself in that path of opportunity. Meeting Steve Fisher, who was part of the Roland uh, V-Drum founding thing. If I didn't put myself out there at a NAMM show, I would have never got the call to even do Roland as a product demonstrator slash specialist. So the same thing goes with book writing. The same thing goes with songwriting. I don't, like you, I don't have any songs placed or different uh, people using my songs or, or performing them or licensing them, but you make an awesome point about everything. I don't care if you want to be a if you're good at being a carpenter, then get out there and start working for someone that has a, a company and until you can start your own. You're totally right. If you sit around, if one sits around, nothing's going to happen. For example, when I look at my past, I've gotten a lot of opportunities that have done well and then failed, maybe because of bad partner or bad business choice or me being young and not knowing. But if I didn't write a book and, and go, I'm going to put this in front of people's faces, it wouldn't have gotten published. Mm-hmm. So that first step of going, I'm going to do it, is the key. If I didn't go to a woodworker in Nashville, outside of, in Hendersonville, to get the first stick laid by hand, the company, I wouldn't have had any stick to show an investor for the thing to happen. So you just made a very solid point, especially about NAM. I mean, my network, NAM for a while almost was my business model. I'm not saying it was the correct business model, but I would go there and try to have promotional packs back in the day, a folder, and <laughs> it was yeah. ridiculous. And now I have missed NAM due to Collective Soul, which is a good problem, as you can imagine. That means there's gigs. But I'm telling you, the, the network I've made inside the drumming industry because of NAM and because of it, was, it enabled me to do clinics for like my living for about 15 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know the climate has changed and we're not doing those kind of clinics that much anymore and the internet's taking over, has taken over, don't get me wrong, but willing to grow. Like you said, get your content filmed, get your stuff. If I don't, I got the gear here, I'm on a light, lights are up right now. It's a matter of doing it and getting it out there. So I'm learning from you on that, to be honest, and also been able to tell certain friends who haven't published a book, now their books are published. Yeah. You know, so that's cool. Well, that, that's a key thing. You know, I, I even think back uh, to when I was starting out. We have a mutual friend who is actually a guest on on season one, Jeff Bowders. Yeah, Jeff. Come on, and, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, when I met Jeff, uh, you know, he was writing his first book. Yeah. And uh, and that was very inspirational for me because it, it kind of kicked. I always wanted to write a guitar book. It kicked my butt to write my first guitar book, which I did back in the early 2000s. Awesome. And, that, you know, that kind of got me into the guitar community and 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 whatnot and so it, you know it does that kind of stuff does play a big role 
But I want to jump back to what you were just talking about, which was, you know, getting something in front of people. And that's such a key component that I'd love to hang on for a little bit, because, you know, I, I know a lot of musicians, they, they write their, their song, but then they're fearful of putting it out or okay. they finish their record and they're fearful of putting it out. They're fearful of rejection. You know, the reality is, is rejection is going to come no matter what it's, you know, everyone yeah. has an opinion, right? Oh. Um, but, but the thing is, is that if you have something that you feel is transformational, and can help people kind of like your drumsticks. You know, those are transformational. I, I knew of you because a lot of my drummer friends were playing your drumsticks back then. That's how I always heard of Johnny Rab drumsticks. I, I knew of the drumsticks before I knew, before I ever met you. Right, totally. And then I met you through a lot of those drummers, you know? Uh, but, um, but the reality is when you have something that's transformational and can make a difference, then it's really your obligation to put it out in front of people. You know, like like a book, like like drumsticks, like, you know, what whatever it can be like a like a program or anything like that. It, it really does fall on you to put it in front of people. But at the same point, the other thing that falls on you is the responsibility, uh, responsibility of letting people know why and how this is transformational and what this can do for them. Yeah. And I think it's massive because you and I have even spoken on the phone and I am one of the same. I fall into the category on some things. I have songs I've written. I haven't decided to put them out. Why? Because I worry about what you just said. Rejection, even from just folks, not trying to get it licensed, not trying to get it on, you know, some sort of publishing deal. Just my solo music, not put it out. I love electronic music. I can, I'm not saying I could write it in my sleep, but I've got decent ideas, but I will hold myself back. No one else is holding me back, just my own brain. We've talked about that. Content for video, for drum lessons. I hold myself back. Sometimes I might make an excuse of, ah, it's too hard to edit. No, it isn't, you know? And you're totally correct on the course factor too. You've had successful courses and obviously you're doing amazing with that. I'm just kind of getting going in that new model. But like the freehand technique is something I developed for years and kind of had VHS tape and then whoops, here comes the DVD market. Whoops, like I was just late. You know, here comes the internet. I'm just this guy that's, Unfortunately, like a little bit late, but I think the internet's not going anywhere. It could be wrong, but I think it's pretty sure it's growing. <laughs> yeah. So I'm ready to kind of do that stuff. And, and I'm, I mean, daily basis, just so everyone knows, battling that, should I release this? Should I do, man, oh, this book, should it, you know? And I've kind of gone the self-publishing route and working with my partner, Troy, on, on getting our publishing company going for books, only because... I have, I think, built the name enough to where the followers that are gonna buy it would, would find it and buy it, or if marketed correctly, buy it. So, but I will say, in do, in taking the plunge, and man, I got totally rejected. I remember Dr Jungle, drum and bass for the acoustic drum set. That's the one that got voted the, the Modern Drummer Award. Yeah. That thing was, companies were like, wait, what is this? I had to like sell them on what drum and bass was, then had to sell them of like, on how or why this would work and why it'd be valuable. And I'm proud of it because it has now become kind of my core curriculum, not even in the genre of, of jungle drum and bass, just drumming. So I'm almost 50 and now I'm, I'm, I'm working on just a straight up curriculum of, of works that, uh, that sounds really arrogant. I don't mean works, you know what I'm saying? Like just a bunch of written books and, and ideas that I can present in a concise format and go, hey, this is this is my stepping stone to the next book. You do this, you do this. I'm not the only drummer. There's thousands and thousands of drummers, but this is my approach to it. And yeah, I just I got to go back to what you said. If you don't do it, it's not happening. There's no way it's happening. No one's going to come and say, hey, dude, remember your Michael, your book you were going to do on guitar. Let's get started. Hey, I just want to jump in here for a second and let you know that if any of your goals over the next year include recording and releasing a new album, generating placements of your songs on TV shows and films, or just building a fan base that will sustain your music career, I want to invite you to my special workshop, Real Musicians Don't Starve. Now in this workshop, we're going to focus on the three keys that are essential to your success and you're going to walk away with an extremely powerful strategy that allows you to create your own wow factor. And this gives you the power to attract musical opportunities to you instead of constantly struggling and chasing after them. 
Now you can check out this workshop for free at realmusiciansdontstarve.com slash workshop. And once again, that's realmusiciansdontstarve.com slash workshop. Now back to the podcast. Let's go back to, to when you were starting uh, in, in your career, because you, you played with a lot of big artists, you know, back in the day, so to say, so to speak, right? How did a lot of those initial auditions and opportunities present themselves? The, the, this is the wackiest part. In all reality, I am never going to pretend this didn't happen any other way. Any formal audition, formal, like go to Soundcheck or SIR and actually audition, none of those happened. I didn't get any of them. I did that for Jody Messina, and I was recommended by Joel Stevenette. This is your drummer that's replacing me right here, Johnny Rabb. Did a formal audition. Bass player already had someone in mind. Now, don't get me wrong. I didn't kill all these auditions. See, I don't want to pretend that, like, I smoked everyone. In fact, the Jody one, um, this was a memorable moment because, you know, Nashville, right? So it was at SAR, which I was not as familiar with as Soundcheck because my office used to be in Soundcheck. So, I was, you know, it felt like it was, like, my home. Mm -hmm. I'm listening to dudes in front of me. This one dude in front of me, Michael something, I can't remember. And it wasn't Carl, it wasn't the the... Michael from Skinner now. Pardon my face rub there. It was uh, Michael something. And this dude smoked this audition. I even remember going, I found out 24 hours before, I went to another studio to like kind of just do the playback and they were nice enough to keep playing it back for me with mics and I could kind of, you know, uh, warm up or, and memorize. And I'll never forget, I'm like, this dude sounds fantastic. There's no chance. Like they, this, they got their guy. Even though I was recommended. Went in, played. I had one little snafu on some like two bar of two four BS turnaround or something that just tricked me weird. And it was so dumb after it happened. I'm like, yep, I get it. Bass players, of course. Bass player who ended up choosing his buddy was looking at me like, oh my God, like that was the worst. And I'm like, dude, you already know you're going to get. Like, you're just <laughs> looking for any. So I did okay, but not that great. So I didn't think I got it. Remember, I thought the other guy in front of me killed me. There was no cell phones back in the day. I'm going to pretend. Bring, hey, John, this is so-and-so, you know, bing, bing, from, uh, yeah, we're going to go ahead and go with someone else. And I went, oh, dude, okay. I'm like, can I ask, was it the guy before me? No. And I'm like, and I don't. I didn't care about ruffling feathers. Went, Are you serious? I'm like, <laughs> who got it? I'm like, that guy killed it. Yeah. Oh, I'd rather not. And it turned out it was like it was his buddy and, you know, whatever. Point in that story is a lot of people do have in their pocket, why wouldn't they have their, their good friend or somebody that's good enough for the gig or maybe better or worse than you, but they're their good buddy. We hear that all the time. So auditions never work for me, including one, a uh, little name drop here, but don't worry, I didn't get the gig. I think my friend Tobias Ralph got it. Me and my bass player friend Clay drove to New York City to do Lauren Hill audition. Oh, wow. That was the only other formal audition I've ever done. It was where she came in the room and it was very weird. And you have to call her Miss Hill and all the stuff. Total respect. I don't care, but it was just like kind of weird. And uh, we played all the hits and whatever. It's fine. But like I'm looking around the room. I know everyone in there. And I'm like, I'm not getting this. Then this dude gets up. That's like an R&B drummer that killed the thing. And his voice was magic. I mean, like full R&B soul lead vocalist. I'm like, I'm done. This is a wasted New York trip. This is... Uh, apparently Tobias got it and he's Tobias Ralph monster drummer so I will tell you that the other gigs were all almost show up and you you play and then you you ease into it. Tanya Tucker was my longest stint and it was also my longest how do you know if you have a gig or not that was my big hang up with Nashville was you don't know how long you have a gig mm -hmm. I mean I'll never forget Tanya Tucker um, the great guitar player oh my god Bukovac, Tom. Oh, yeah, Tom. Fantastic. So I like Tom as a... This is another thing. I didn't know Tom was a whiz at guitar. Tom was playing bass with a blues band that opened, not opened, happened to be on a bill before this battle of the bands. He was just filling in on bass. And I play with my band King Size at 3rd and Lindsley, the bar and grill thing. And we're like trying to win this Lightning 100 best band thing, right? So Tom's a bass player. And after I get done, he goes, hey, man... I don't play bass, really. I'm, I'm really a guitar player. Do you want to play with Tanya Tucker? <laughs> it's 
So at Third and Lindsley, he's they're looking for a drummer. Let me call my friend Brian Frazier. Sure enough, calls. I trial by fire, no rehearsals, get on the bus and sub the first gig. Got a few dirty looks. I don't blame her. I mean, because I didn't I didn't know their transitions and stuff. She has a pretty serious interlude transition show. It's not just three, four and counting it off. I ended up doing that gig for like a year and then no 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 excuse me for like three four months and I'll never forget and all these stories are hopefully you're cool with them because it really taught me a lesson that you don't know when you could get let go or you don't know how long unless you're on some signed contract which I've never seen folks I've never seen a like you're gonna be in this for 12 years as the touring person you're verbal you are you know, you, you don't know, and they don't owe you anything nine times out of ten when they say see ya. And I'll never forget that same guy who I love to death, Brian Frazier. We had just been in the bus. It's about midnight. And this is three months in. Everything's going great. We're celebrating. We're having beers on the bus. Jokes are flying. And I'll never forget, right here is the bus headlights, windshield. Brian's over where you are in, in context, so he's facing me. Sure. And I'm going, hey, he goes, can I talk to you a sec? No BS. Sure, man. We just got done joking around. Hey, uh, Tanya wants to go another route, so um, try another couple drummers. Just a different feel. So come on back on the bus. Let's have some fun. And I'm like, you have got to be getting. I had to pretend overnight that I was cool with this getting let go at a front of, in the front of the bus at a Flying J or some sort of crap like that. Yeah. Go home, pick up the phone, and this is always the inside joke of everybody. I worked at Red Lobster straight up for seven years, on and off, because it was the one place I could bartend and wait tables that I could almost quit, because they always need people there. No offense to Red Lobster. So I could like be like, the guy's like, oh, what do you mean you got a tour? And I'm like, hey, I, I, I might need that. And I will remind everyone, never quit, quit a job unless it's some, a job that, um, like always say, Always leave nicely. Don't be like, I got a gig with so and so. I'm I'm gonna leave Cracker Barrel. You know what I mean? Like, don't just be like, hey, keep in good graces. I'm promise you guys that I did three returns to Lobster before finally getting in the rolling door and like kind of doing that route and the stick company taking over. Um, you never know when a restaurant gig will come in handy. So I'm, I'm, I even to this day, Tandy Tucker was my favorite gig out of Nashville. Um, and I heard through Brian last week, which has made my day, that she said to say hi to me. That made my day because we had gone like this. You don't know, you know, what's going on. She's trying to people. Then, then uh, the Charlie Daniels, the original drummer, Jack Gavin was was vying. Rumor has it vying for the MD, uh, musical director, whatever you call him. What do you call it? Is it right? Yeah, Band music director. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just don't use those terms that much. So <laughs> medical doctor. Yeah. So uh, he, uh, I, I think I was at one point, even a guy that was replacing him, quote unquote, because there was a disagreement about, hey, I want to be MD. And Tanya might've said, no, again, rumor guys, rumor. This is all hearsay. So I was put in a position to go do like three gigs. She's like, oh, Johnny, you're out of here again. And then rehired Jack Gavin. Now Mike Malinan from the Goo Goo Dolls is Tanya's drummer for the past three, four, five years, which I'm pumped about. I talked to Mike on the phone, uh, and I just am happy for him. She's a great artist in person, and um, other than that, buddies, that buddy, it, 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 there was no formal audition. The Maynard Ferguson that was filling in for someone, and I knew how to read charts well, and my connection there was my drumstick company president. I've I've never gotten an, uh, a gig from an audition. Uh, all, all the gigs I've gotten have all been through recommendation. I've gone to plenty of auditions, never got never got the gig from the audition. But you know, one thing that was interesting for me and the biggest um, shock to me when I moved back to Nashville from Los Angeles, I never had any any real gigs in Nashville prior to studio other than studio stuff before I left for for LA. That was actually one of the reasons I left for LA was. Like, you know, all my buddies were out on the road. I was spending, you know, I was 25 years old, hanging out in studios all day long, all summer long while my buddies were out on, on, on the road. Right. But I could never, I could never even land the audition. I just never got into that circle because I was so ingrained into the studio circle. So, you know, that, that's kind of what ultimately pushed me out to Los Angeles. 
Right. And um, and when I came back, of course, when you're in L.A., you get a gig and you have, you know, two weeks worth of rehearsals. Right. And yeah. I came back to Nashville and I very quickly started landing some gigs with some country artists. And the the gigs were literally meetings at a coffee shop with someone who recommended me. I would meet with the artist and, you know, their music director. And then after, you know, a half hour conversation, it'd be like, well, here's the CD. You think you'd be ready for, a, you know, uh, by, by Friday. Meanwhile, it's a Monday. Yep. No rehearsal. You're going to go off and do like four shows. And, uh, you know, one, one a funny story is it's actually on video. Um, funny story that I have is a group called Low Cash. Uh, okay. I know them or not, but I ended up getting a call like on a Monday or Tuesday to go do a run with them. Uh, and so, uh, they were leaving like on a Thursday night and literally like three days worth of, you know, uh, ahead of time. Uh, and, uh, so I ended up, uh, doing that and, uh, I think it was like a three or four day run, three or four shows, but the first show is in Uncasville, Connecticut. You can type in like low cash Uncasville. I know Connecticut. Exactly. Okay. Okay. And there, and, uh, and someone had videotaped the show and, uh, they videotaped the show from my side of the stage. But the funny thing is, is that on the bus right up, I'm literally charting the songs. So before the show, I have my charts all off to the side. And this is one of those like like half moon type of uh, stages where it kind of wraps around, you know, like a semicircle. And so I have off to the side my charts uh, and the, the set list along with the keys and just my notes on how I'm going to get through each song. I set it up. You know, we're backstage right before we walk, you know, as, as we as we walk out on stage, I grab my guitar and we walk out on stage for the first song. I look down. Someone had taken all of my charts and notes for yep. the entire show. And I remember yep. after the first song, I was like I was like leaning down to the people in the front. Row. I'm like, do you know who took my stuff? And they're like, no. And I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to get through the show. I've never played these songs before with these people in my life, you know, and that was literally the the first uh, the first show with them. Um, but that to me was such a shock. Compared to what the, the the pop world was like, where you literally go through like weeks of rehearsals. I have, you know, I can say this, I'm going to really make this quick because I, I, unfortunately she passed away. But um, Minnie McCready, if I'm not mistaken, I did uh, exactly the same thing you did. I had notes. I was filling in for a weekend. She had high heels on. She came over and high heeled through my charts. <laughs> yep. And I was like, this is amazing. And I think I have that on video somewhere too. And what a, I feel bad what happened to her, but anyway, that was an interesting thing. And I told Jesse from, uh, you know, lead guitar collective soul. He lives in Nashville. Yeah. I said, Hey man, just, uh, you mentioned LA. So now go like this, LA, Nashville Collective Soul. And this is not a slam. I actually think it's pretty amazing. We don't do those mile-long rehearsals. We literally will do no more than one day of hitting a few tunes, and that's it. Yeah. And I kind of tried to warn Jesse. I said, I know you're used to the eight-hour sound check SAR. Hey, let's try that again. Hey, here after this song, it goes into this. Nope. Everyone's like, how much do you guys rehearse? I'm like, we do not rehearse. And I'm not gloating it's more how yeah. it went you yeah. know one of the things that, that's interesting about your story and, and with so many people actually that i've that i've had on the podcast is uh you know not everyone lives in the same town you know because you guys are based out of atlanta but you live up in, in indiana you got dean in san diego you got will in atlanta and ed in atlanta and jesse in nashville and me yeah. in indianapolis yeah we fly COVID happened we we literally had a New Year's show in Florida, kind of some distancing, which wasn't as distance as I was thinking, but whatever, we did it. Uh, and then we had, it was safe, but it was just interesting to see Florida wide open like that. Mm -hmm. um, we got together before the Sticks 8 show run and did exactly what I just told you. One, yeah. day, one day for crew to set up stuff. The next day was three hours tops of just... <laughs> brushing up yeah you know but yeah. no more no like oh hey let's don't forget to yeah. nope no nope. the nice thing though is that you guys have been a core for quite some time and yeah. and you know you, you you have you have played a lot of shows together where as like you know with the a lot of the nashville scene with a lot of the you know country artists is that it, it does become a bit of a you know a revolving door 
you know, as, I mean, I can't tell you how many, how many runs I've done where like we have a new bass player showing up to go do the next three shows and you've never met this person before, you know? So, uh, yeah. that's kind of standard in that world. I'm trying to think of, uh, this really happened too. And I don't remember what artist, uh, Oh my gosh, strawberry wine. What's that one? What is that? Oh yeah, I know. Not is that Deanna Carter? Or? Yeah, yeah, Deanna Carter. Yeah, so she just one gig ended. I'm not kidding around when I tell you I got on an airplane out of Nashville to go do a Roland gig, and the guitar player was in front of me in the seat. He's like, "Hey, dude, cool man, good to see you." He thought the entire flight I was going to the gig that he was having right then. I'm like, <laughs> he's like, "Hey, man, come on." I'm like. What I'm like, oh, you're gigging tonight? He's like, I'm like, that's how I found out I was no longer in the gig, by the way. Wow. Yeah. I've, I've, I've had, uh, Those are neat. I've had an incident like that too. <laughs> I mean, that is the most stupid. And now that I'm like in a better spot, I'm not saying I'm going to be condescending here, but I am going to say, screw that. Yeah. That's one fault that needs to be fixed. Yeah. It's so disrespectful to just call and say, we have a new drummer. We have a new guitar player. Your I services guess. are no longer needed. Do something. Don't find out because you're on an airplane and the dude's in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had, a, I had a gig with an artist and the bass player called me one day and says, hey, you know, they're playing. They're playing in town with their new band. And I was like, oh, I didn't know they had a new band. He says, yep. So he's like, let's go down and check them out. So we actually did. We went downtown to go watch the new band for the artist that we've been playing with for like, you know, two, two and a half years. And we never got a phone call. So it is what it is. But, you know, that a lot of this kind of goes back to the whole, you know, with room musicians don't starve. My, my, my focus yeah. is really, you know, on on really the three keys to success. You know, the skill set, which obviously, like that goes without saying, you have to have the skills, right? Yes. But then, but then it's like it's you know the other element are are like for example like your purposeful actions. I call it your purposeful actions. You know, and 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 what we've talked about so far is is very heavy on on the actions of of putting yourself in a position to uh you know to have opportunities happen for you and then the thing is you know once you get settled one of the nice things especially now is once you get settled you're not obligated to live you know in in a big music industry town like los angeles or or nashville even you know once you've established yourself the reality is that you can live anywhere and and you know we're seeing that with a lot of people that we know mutually who are no longer living in either of these big, you know, music cities, music industry towns. In fact, I'll even argue and say that Nashville is no longer a music industry town. Uh, you know, there's so many other industries that are coming here that uh, the music industry is a very small part of Nashville as opposed to what it was, you know, 15, 20 years ago. No, you made a super solid point, which is not surprising, of not living in the same town. I moved from 2009 to Chicago, kind of throwing my hands in the air. I honestly thought I wasn't maybe going to play drums for a living anymore. Uh, met my now wife. I divorced in 2009 slash 10. Happy now, as you know. But I literally, hands were in the air. I'm like, oh, hair will get me to all the places Roland needs me, me to go quickly, which was like Australia, Japan, these places that I didn't want to have connections. So when that collective soul thing happened, you're right, it didn't matter where I was. And then what you just said, purposeful actions and then also the skill set, I believe you have to have the first things first. Prerequisite, are you good at what you do? You better be good at what you do because you never know when that opportunity happens. If the opportunity happens, you don't know what you're doing, you could be screwed. If you know what you're doing, you might not get the audition, but you get another opportunity to do something later. Purposeful actions, you hit it on the head. I can teach drums. I can teach master classes and during COVID, I was able to do that through certain websites or on Skype, or you get it. So you said starving musicians uh, or whatever. What was it again? Real musicians don't starve. Real musicians. Uh, Freudian slip there. You feel like you might be starving, but you got to go back to that whole Who Moved My Cheese book of like you can sit in him and ha over, you know, at the end of the maze, you just go to the same maze, my cheese has moved. Or you can go find the cheese that has been moved. In other words, whether it's teaching for me or... I have an education degree. Okay, is it time to go teach at a university or try to? Is it so? It's it's our choice as people to either sit and go, well, man, what happened to my gig, or make up gigs. You've done it. You know how to play guitar. You could not do what you're doing right now and go get playing gigs in a cover band in a pro uh, touring act like like a foreigner. You get my point. The, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Any gig you wanted, you have the skill set. 
But that's where the opportunity has to happen. Everyone would like to play with, you know, Foreigner or let's do other band like I'm in Duran Duran somehow. Yeah. Those opportunities don't just go Duran Duran's needing a guitar player or drummer. It you might have to wait a while for the opportunity, but you better be ready with your skill set when it when it happens. And I think you're bringing to light other stuff. If you took away Collective Soul, I'd make this very clear. I would like to work with Collective Soul until they don't want to do it anymore. That's my goal. But if if somehow they decide they don't want to, I sure better be ready the instant I get a call saying either we don't want you anymore, we hate how you play, or we're done. Whatever the thing, I'm, I don't take it for granted. I don't think like, I. what do you mean, dude? I'm, t- I'm your drummer. I love that feeling I feel like they're drummer, and I really do feel like that, but I'm not stupid in thinking that everything lasts forever. So the moment that, that they don't want to do it anymore, no matter how it ends, it will be hugs, handshakes, this was an amazing ride. I don't care if it's tomorrow, I would say the same thing, but I better be ready with a plan B, C, D. Mm-hmm. You know, hence the drumstick company, hence trying to write some books and some play-alongs and um, a little bit of real estate you and I talked about. You know what I mean? Like there's, yeah. there's, You better not just only... It's cool to have tons of eggs, but you better have, yeah. in my opinion, multiple baskets. Yeah, and that, that goes like to the third element with, you know, because there's really three keys to success. You got your skill set, your your purposeful actions, and then the third one is really your mindset. And and to me, it comes back, ultimately, the skill set's a given, but it comes back to more than anything, the mindset, because the mindset determines the yeah. skill set and the mindset determines the actions that you take, you know, and uh, and, and to me, it's it's exactly what you said. It, it is a matter of being prepared and it is a matter of, of looking forward, you know, and, and planning for the future. That That is a very, very, very important uh, yeah. aspect. Um, and then at the same point, you know, when, when you're when you're of the right mindset that you know that there are opportunities, not that are necessarily waiting for you, but opportunities that you can go and find and, and opportunities that you can put yourself in the path of, it completely changes the game and, and how you approach just everything. Like like you said, like you could throw your hands up in the air and you could have gone and, and you know, just sold paint at Home Depot. Yeah. Right. But the reality is that you also recognize you had the skill set. And, and, and you love doing what you're doing. And so it's like, well, the opportunity right now is, well, let's go work with Roland for a while. Yeah. Let's go, you know, and let's go do the educational materials. And, and, and there are like ebbs and flows, you know, you have your, you have your seasons where things are busy and, and then like any other, you know, season you have your know, musician or career, really, you have the seasons where there's not a lot going on. And yeah. really it's what we do during the season when there's not a lot going on that determines the whole next phase that whole next ramp up for and and the duration of the next season where there's going to be a lot going on for us and it doesn't always have to be musical it doesn't have to be playing in a band it can be creating you know content it it can be teaching it can be as you said like you know taking the the prior successes you've had and investing that in other outlets for example such as real estate which we see so many musicians heavily invested in real estate you know and and that's something that we've talked about you know extensively you know, previously. Yeah. Um, so those are to me the three key elements that when when all of them are in alignment, it's it's nearly impossible for you to become a starving musician. Yeah. But you can become a starving musician when just one of those are not in alignment. Completely agree. Like COVID did set me back a little bit because I wasn't teaching a lot. But I got on the horse and kind of did that. And thankfully Bridget does well and I'm not one to ride coattails, but in this case it was like look we hope this bounces back. I still was doing that. I was working on the 80s cover band slash original band. So there's always forward motion trying to track for people. So you just, you kind of hit it like in Troy, my business partner in the sticks and more, he kind of did the terms, you know, a fixed mindset and growth mindset. And I have to agree that having a growth mindset, which just means being willing to go, I can change is so important. Fixed is sitting there and going like, I'm in a band and like, I just got fired and then sitting for months going, I just got fired. Yeah. I just got fired rather than, man, what do I do? Okay, let's go get a bartending job now to make sure the rent is covered. Then what are my other things on the off hours yeah. to get back in the game that I love? If you're one of those folks that is kind of like doing the single leg of the tripod mm-hmm. uh, and the tripod meaning trying to have three things going without spreading yourself too thin that if one of them falls apart, which it did for me. Touring went away for everyone. Um, 
and during that time, uh, Collector Soul was very cool and helped me some, and I love that, for, love them for that. But still, it was not the income I was having from touring, which right. which is so that's that's kind of where I'm at. Michael is like now trying to very fortunately have Collective Soul touring um, as my main career, but it now allows me to explore all the things we've talked about on private conversations, but that relate to what you're doing right now on this podcast slash video, uh, learning to not be starving as a musician. Right. Well, I, I always like to, uh, to, to share our manifesto uh, during the podcast. So I'm going to do that right now. And that is that real musicians are business owners and our business is music. A business is simply an organization where value is provided in order to make a profit. And unlike starving musicians who operate with a mindset of scarcity and fear, as success-driven musicians, we operate with a mindset of abundance, confidence, and service. We are doers, we are dreamers, we are creators, and we are achievers. And we know that our true value is determined by how many people we serve and how well we serve them. Because our truth is that real musicians don't starve. I love that entire thing. I can't wait. You need to... I need to get that on paper in front of put it in my studio. That's great. <laughs> well, Johnny, is there? Uh, I'll, I'll get that to you for sure. Is there? Um, how can what? What do you have coming up right now? I know that you've got the drumsticks uh, and you you have a bunch of new new stuff like that to share. So for all the drummers who are who are hanging with us, uh, what would you like to share with them that you have coming up? Well, I'm super excited because it's been a, it's I had a decently successful drumstick company Johnny Rob Drumsticks we talked about and now it's back me and uh, my co-owner uh, and partner Troy Dares uh, are working on relaunching the company we've got the rhythm saws you know here they are that's the stick with the teeth you can do all yep. sorts of all sorts of crazy stuff on the drums and we've also got like our traditional models back in action 7A through uh, 2B which is pretty exciting um and I just can't wait for that to be out there. And Troy's been working so hard, I've got to give him complete props because everything from designing and, and, and helping me on the business side and, and making the right choices with uh, manufacturing, et cetera, I've learned so much from him. So that's massively on the horizon for us. And we're looking to uh, be up and going selling, I hope, by latest winter, uh, if not earlier this, uh, in the fall. That's a big one. The curriculum again, um, trying to work on the book writing and re, kind of revamp some of my older publications into our own uh, publishing company. And then I'm trying to track from home. I've got behind me is the drum room, fully operational, being able to send people tracks. Like a lot of drummers, don't get me wrong. I don't think it's like not saturated. It's saturated. But as you said, multiple things going on. I'm also trying to get things like learn from you on the placement with the 80s band and U80. We're, we're looking to try to get placements. We, good writing, bunch of guys. We've got originals out. We're not naive in thinking that it's the record deal days of the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> but, we, but we would like to, we're proud of what we've done. The productions are, are really good. And we've got an EP coming out that uh, Bob St. John co-produced with us and uh, mix and mastered. It's, it's, it's pretty good. And Trying to just also not forget about how important family is um, in the mix of everything. I've got two kids and an awesome wife, and they, you know, everything from uh, teaching uh, the B the BMV here, Bureau of Motor Vehicles, to my daughter and teaching her how to drive, to little Carmen, who's eight, and um, trying to teach her soccer and make sure I can do stuff with her, and still have time to fish. So I'm really... But I've got a lot of ideas even outside the music industry that, and you just said doers, creators. I'm a little crazy down here in the fungin. This is the fungin I'm in, fun dungeon. <laughs> and uh, I have a lot of goals. I don't know if they'll all come true, but it's, life is kind of cool that I don't necessarily know why we're here, but I'm pumped that I was given a gift of, I believe, a creative mind and like entrepreneur style human and it's super fun. Even if you fail, get back up, get on the horse, ride the horse of life, ride the bike of life. Yeah. Yeah. That well, getting back to, to your, to your drumsticks uh, real quick. That's like I said earlier, uh, you know, when I was starting my career 
Uh, in the early 2000s, a lot of my drummer friends, a lot of you know session guys here in Nashville that I was working with, and even a bunch of my friends who were out touring, they were always uh, talking about Johnny Rab drumsticks, Johnny Rab drumsticks, and and uh, of course I I didn't know about any of this sure. kind of stuff, you know, and and uh, and then um, a very close friend, I guess I mentioned earlier, Jeff Bowders was the one who you know kind of I was like, who, what is this Johnny Rab drumstick? He's like, oh, it's this new company, they make the most amazing sticks, and this and that, and. And that's ultimately how I heard about you. And then, of course, you know, because I, I, I think drummers are just some of the coolest people ever. Uh, so a lot of my friends, uh, you know, were drummers. That's just kind of how I fell into that that circle and then ended up, you know, meeting you years ago. And then, of yeah. course, over the years of being out in Los Angeles and, and at NAMM show and then walking around NAMM with them and reconnecting with you and whatnot. So so the, the Johnny Rab drumsticks, even though it's it's it took a hiatus for, for a time, there's such an incredible track record that you have with that, with that company that uh, I'm, I'm excited to see what's going to uh, happen for you now moving forward. Thank you. It's a whole new uh, climate and dynamic of the industry, way different from back then, but we believe we still have quality product. And I really believe that it'll be a good thing. It's going to be, it's going to be different, but it's, it's still that same feel and everything like that. So I'm pumped. And back in those days in Nashville, I was going to say real quick, we were lucky. We, we, took a lot of artists away from other companies just due to the, I think, personal touch and family feel. And it, it, I hope to, get, you know, gain confidence back from folks and, you know, but it's kind of everyone deserves a good stick and we're trying to make that happen. And I, I just love that part of the thing too, manufacturing and uh, a product, like a solid, actually hard product. Right. And so people can go to johnnyrab.com to learn more. JohnnyRab.com. If you want to Instagram it at JohnnyRab, J O H N N Y R A B B, and then uh, it's up now, but we'll be updated. JohnnyRabDrumsticks.com will be the main sales place for that. But also, just my Instagram is personal and business, yeah. and I'll be doing content and stuff there. That's probably the main place if everyone wants to hit me up on there. But yeah, I have to say that your Instagram is is a lot of fun. I've spent a lot of time the last couple of weeks watching all your uh, backstage behind the scenes at, at the Collective Soul and Sticks shows because you guys were doing a series, a whole run for a while, and uh, it was awesome. Every day, I you know Johnny would pretty much start out where the, where the buses were, and he'd end up uh, backstage and interviewing the different. Uh, technicians and and yeah. showing the facility and and all that and it was, it was really a great i've not seen that from anyone else but it was a really great behind the scenes of what touring life is like what the daily setup is like so i encourage you to you know if that's of interest to you i definitely encourage you to follow johnny for that and i hope that you continue doing those because those are those are a lot of fun to watch well thank you for that and the support on that because now that i'm home i'm trying to like realize hey maybe i can do the same thing here and answer questions or whatever but that is kind of a no-brainer content. There's so much going on backstage, right? So, and these people, like you said, the true word technicians, they are hired. People forget that you can't just call them roadies. That's not good. Technicians are what they do, whether it's a monitor engineer or lighting director or front of house engineer or guitar tech, a stage manager. I mean, it's ridiculous. Tour manager. It doesn't just, you don't just see the four guys, five guys get on a bus and go do a rock show. You know, it's 13, 14 people behind the scenes. So, and and the technology is is un, unbelievable. Yes. It goes on to, in in putting the, these shows together nowadays. Yeah, totally, totally. Well, Johnny, I, I appreciate you taking the time and uh, and thank you so much for uh, sharing your story and and insight with us. Oh, you're the best. I really appreciate you as a friend. And congratulations on your success of what you've done in the music business, buddy. You've taught me a lot, and you inspire me and others. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks, buddy.